Hey everyone. Thank you for coming. If you're planning on joining Alex and I, please grab a seat. Uh, we are sitting in a traffic corridor. Can you hear us all right up the back? Thumbs up. Let us kick off with respect by acknowledging the Ghana people who are the traditional custodians of the Adelaide Plains and pay our respects from up here and collectively to the elders past and present, recognizing and respecting the cultural heritage, the beliefs, the relationship to land, and to acknowledge that the ground where we're meeting today, sovereignty over this ground was never ceded. Uh, a little bit of housekeeping I think there were some change to the COVID regulations overnight, but the virus doesn't care. So we're keeping things uh, for anybody who's attended any other Riders Week events as that were. Well, please maintain social distancing. Don't move the chairs around too much. Kind of try and stay reasonably well spaced apart. Uh, there's no cop going to enforce this, but please wear masks if you can. We strongly encourage that. And if you are given an instruction by a COVID marshal uh, or one of the festival staff, please. Um, just do as they are requesting. I think that's it. That's all the housekeeping. It's really lovely to see you all here. My name is uh, Scott Ludlam, and I'm really grateful to have been invited to the session by Alex, who's somebody who's got a lot to say about the subject of untangling, breaking up with fossil fuels. It's a heavy subject. We're going to be talking about dissolving, ending, an incredibly destructive and unhealthy relationship between fossil fuels and the arts. That's what we're talking about. I'm going to give most of the floor to Alex, but we're also going to make this as interactive as we can. This is a working session. There's a lot of work to be done. So here we go. Um, it's really lovely to see you. Alex Kelly, everybody. Thanks, Scott. <laughs> Do I just get to start raving? No, just no, no. Just maybe a little quick intro. Um, <laughs> you, as didn't, to you didn't do your intro. My intro is, no, I'm, my name is Scott. Uh, I used to be in politics. Now I'm an activist and a writer. And enough said about that, the better. That'll do for me. Who and are you? I'm Alex Kelly. I've come over from Jajawarung country in central Victoria. And I'm a filmmaker and an activist and an orchardist. An orchardist. Um, that is awesome. So... Let's get to it, because I think you do have a bit of an opening statement just to kind of set the ground yeah. and get this conversation set up. What is the connection between fossil fuels and the arts in Australia? How entangled are they? What are we dealing with? Very entangled and very messy. And actually, we should, we should have had a picture up of it on here. There's some um, incredible artists in Melbourne called the Centre for Everything, Gabrielle de Vietri and Will Foster. And they created um, what they called a network map and they did a big research project on the relationship between the arts and the fossil fuels in Australia. And the map is a total mess. It's just a thread of entangled relationships. Some of that is direct funding, some of that is patronage, some of that is board members, um, some of that is awards, prizes, decision makers. It's completely connected. And many people would remember that Sam Walsh, who was previously the Rio Tinto CEO for 25 years, was the board of the Australia Council for six years, the chair of the board of the Australia Council. I'm going to do a bit of a list, and it took me a long time to choose which things to pick because there are hundreds and hundreds of these examples, but I just want to point out a few. And then I also want to talk about why it's a problem because I also want to acknowledge that as artists, there's not a lot of money around. And we've also just experienced a really couple of tough years with COVID. We've had so much work cancelled and not everything that was cancelled, we weren't, we weren't still paid for that. So I want to acknowledge that this is a difficult conversation. The question of where we get money otherwise we'll yep. come to. But for now, I just want to acknowledge a few of the ways that we're entangled. Um, I just had a memory. Um, was anyone in Adelaide around... 20 years ago in 2002 for the Reclaim the Mullet protest. Does anyone remember that? 
Yeah, this was when Hyundai was sponsoring the Fringe and there was a counter festival set up and a, an amazing series of protest events and a, a number of those artists were actually arrested in those protests and that was really at the time that there was really significant conversations happening about corporate globalisation and so they were really talking about the fact that Hyundai had really terrible labour practices and were saying we don't want Hyundai connected to the Fringe. So I guess also at the top of this, of this conversation, I want to say that artists have been actively calling this out and looking at these relationships and questioning what the implications are for our work for a really long time. But it shouldn't just be on the artists to be doing that work. So here in um, South Australia, the South Australian Film Commission has just appointed Julie Cooper to the board and she's got a background in weapons companies including BAE, BAE Systems, who are a British multinational arms security and aerospace company. Why is someone with a background in weapons companies on the State Film Commission board? Closer to home with the Adelaide Festival, Jim Wally also has a background in weapons and airlines companies, and David Knox is a former senior executive of BP and Santos. The logic here is also definitely influenced by neoliberalism, the idea that all, everything that we do has to become a business, whether it's a hospital or an arts festival, we're expected to set it up in a particular way, have a board that it's a particular model, govern in a, in a particular way. And th this logic means that we're told that we need business people on our board to tell artists how to run their work as businesses. And so they go looking for corporations, we get people from KPMG, from Deloitte, we get accountants, and then we end up with all of these weapons, military executives and fossil fuel companies on the boards of our arts organisations. Just last week, Tim Winton called out the Perth at the Perth Writers' Festival um, a new work by the Western Australian Symphony Orchestra called Become Ocean, which was originally written as a work reflecting global heating. Um, and that work has been directly sponsored by Woodside. And that is a company that is setting up the Scarborough Gas Project. Also here in South Australia, you'd all be very familiar with the incredibly damaging impacts of the Roxby Downs uranium mine, BHP, and the 17 plus million dollars that BHP are putting into the Tanathi Festival here. This has got a really long history. I don't know if anyone's seen the incredible film, um, The Back of Beyond. It's a 1954 documentary about Tom Cruise, who was a, um, the postman on the Birdsville track. It's one of my favourite Australian documentaries, but that was actually made by the Shell Film Unit. So this is a long story. And I, I do want to just mention in terms of BHP and Tanathi, um, these companies do need to be giving money to First Nations people. They do have to be paying the rent. They do have to be paying reparations. But they shouldn't also get to put a badge on artwork and look good at the same time. So a couple of other examples that are closer to my heart. Um, one, I lived in the Northern Territory for a long time and Santos um, currently one of the number of gas companies that are trying to get into fracking across the Territory and Santos are the biggest sponsor of the Darwin Festival. Another one that I want to point to is um, Twiggy Forest, Western Australian iron ore magnate, has just set up a social impact film fund at his Mindaroo Foundation. Why is this bad? There's a long list of why is this bad, but I'll just run through them very quickly. And one of them is, is actually the fact that these things are hiding in plain sight. We've got so used to it. We drive past sports stadiums, we go to cancer awards, we watch football teams, we go to see art shows, and we just look past the logos. We're so used to seeing them. We've become so accepting of this idea that, well, of course the government wouldn't pay for it. We, we're, we accept the absence of the state, and we accept that these corporations are gonna pick up the tab. And when we do that, we also step into a relationship that has very insidious and slippery implications for our creativity. And these things are really hard to, put, to, to pin down because we sign contracts when we get funding that says that they're not going to buy editorial control. But even having these kinds of conversations makes programmers nervous, makes festivals nervous because we start to self-censor. We start to think if we do X, 
how will that damage our relationship with this funder? So we start to second guess ourselves and change the way that we behave. It changes our programming, it changes the content of what we do, it changes the, sh the, the shape of the work. But also, we're trading our social license as artists. We're trading our cultural capital, our power as makers, our work as artists, and we are providing them with cover. We're providing them with social license. So, yeah, that's yeah. my introductory yes. rave. <laughs> that is a superb rave, and that's the best I think I've ever heard that described. Um, do you want me to just do a little bit of a piece on kind of what it's embedded in? Is that helpful? Yeah, I do, because I think, I think it's really important as well, because one of the reasons I think people feel troubled to discuss this and sometimes people shrug and say, well, all money's bad and we're all implicated, so there's nothing I can do about it. Yeah. Or they feel worried that this is a gotcha moment. And reading that list out wasn't about going, hey, gotcha, Adelaide Festival, you too have a mining executive, because they're everywhere. And we are all complicit and we're all implicated. Yeah. But I think it's important to zoom out from the arts and look at the fact that this isn't just a problem in our sector, it's everywhere. Yeah. It is huge, but we're not doing that to overwhelm, I suppose. If we take a little bit of a helicopter view for a second as to, well, what are the, what are the broader relationships that um, this kind of situation that Alex has just described are embedded in is not to send us away feeling despairing because it's so huge. It's, oh, okay, unless we overthrow capitalism, we can't do art anymore. That's not what we're doing here. Um, and we are gonna finish up with some interesting uh, ideas and suggestions, and we're certainly interested in yours for what we do about it tactically, here and now. There are campaigners and some very motivated people in this crowd, so I feel like we can do, we can do what we need to do. Um, I wanna just, I'll, I'll do a little plug for this, right? This is a, a document that I just uh, was a, a collaborator and a co-author with the Australian Democracy Network called Confronting State Capture. Can I do a really quick show of hands? Who here today has come across or heard this phrase, state capture? That looks like maybe a little less than half, which is good. I reckon if we'd asked six months ago, there wouldn't have been so many hands. So state capture is this thing that can occur along the slide between what we would ordinarily imagine as corruption and oligarchy. It's a distinct phenomenon that was clocked by, as first as, as far as I'm aware, by the World Bank when they were watching what was happening after the breakup of the Soviet Union in the 1990s to post-Soviet republics where you were kind of getting these petty oligarchies forming, even though you had emerging democratic practice at the same time, you had parliaments, you had reasonably raucous and free media, you had emerging civil society organizations. People were experimenting with freedom at the same time as you had these emerging oligarchies seizing larger and larger share of, uh, of powerful economic sectors. I first came across the phrase in South Africa in 2018 when I was researching a book and they use it there again to describe this thing that is much more systematic, systematic and entrenched than corruption, but less locked down and terrifying than oligarchy. It's a distinct place in the middle. It's the contention of, of the, the co-authors in this report that Australia is suffering from a case of state capture at the bare minimum at the hands of the resources sector, of which the fossil fuel industry is embedded, and the arms industry. Those are the two case studies that we looked at in here. One of the ways in which this is done, and one of the ways in which industry continues to operate despite perpetuating enormous harm, including this week. If you've got friends or loved ones or family in the Northern Rivers or Southeast Queensland, you'll be well aware what I'm talking about. How do you conduct enormous harm and perpetuate incredible crimes on a host community and still maintain your ability to work is with this phrase Alex mentioned earlier, social license. And that isn't a thing that arises organically, that is engineered and manufactured and assiduously cultivated by aligning yourself with the, the local footy oval or the Australian ballet or fringe world in Perth. And social license is by, I love that phrase that you used before, like they're borrowing the social license of the arts and cladding themselves in it and using us as advertising collateral for remarkably small amounts of money. I've probably gone a bit off my brief there, haven't I? <laughs> Hang on. Well, that, I mean, yeah, <laughs> so you identify <laughs> six, six ways in which stage capture operates, which are financial interventions, yeah. 
lobbying and personal influence, revolving doors. We all know about MPs that are in Parliament and then they're out in the gas company or the military companies. Yeah. Institutional repurposing, research and policy and public influence campaigns. And one of the lines that really struck me about this report was this identification that the private sector have greater access to decision makers than citizens. Because when I read it, I didn't read it as a surprise, I read it as something that I knew and accepted as normal. And yeah. then I read it again and I thought, why are we at this point that we have come to accept it as completely normal right. that corporations have greater access to the parliament that represents us than we do? And it really, I was like, wow, even with the analysis that I have, I've come to accept that as normal. Like, yeah. that's just how it is. And, that, and so I think... I think we really need to dig into this this question of social license because even though it's manufactured and it's deliberately sought out, it exists in a... So you have licences to operate which include labour rights and how you regulate labour, you have to get environmental protection laws, you have to... There's all these kind of permits and policies that are regulated, but social licence exists in a much more slippery place, which yeah. is actually also why it is a place that we can intervene, because it's contestable, and people argue and say, you don't have a social licence. Yes, I do have a social licence. So this is a really interesting point of intervention, because yeah. public opinion and social licence are not fixed things. Yeah. So you've, you've got a couple of examples here, or this phrase of art washing, we're familiar with that, right? like greenwashing but with the arts. You're, you're kind of hollowing and co-opting out something that is good and something that people love and turning it into a mobile, fairly low-cost billboard for enormously harmful and destructive industries. Um, and just on yeah, that, I, like with the Santos example in Darwin, the Darwin Festival has an absolutely brilliant opening night. It's a free concert. It's one of the biggest showcases of Indigenous musicians in the Northern Territory. It's a, it's a banging night. It's a brilliant opening night. It's the Santos opening night. A lot of those Indigenous artists live in communities who are fighting back against fracking. Yeah. And they're in a position where they can't get up on stage and campaign against fracking or talk about fracking and back their communities and the traditional owners that are fighting fracking because they don't want to lose the opportunity to perform at this incredible showcase. Right. So this is the other piece where it's not just about artists' choices about where they position themselves, it's also about the decisions that arts festivals and arts boards and arts managers and programmers are making about the relationships they're prepared to have and the position that then puts artists into. Right. Well, the, what occurs to me, and we just saw this happen actually in a slightly different context with, um, with Sydney Festival, uh, is that it drives this enormous wedge into the arts community where people are kind of forced to pick a side uh, within you know, individual arts practice or board members, um, or even, I guess, up north, it'll be families, right? It's this incredibly yeah. destructive and corrosive wedge that gets driven in, and none of us are asking for that. So um, I'm keen to ask you what you reckon we ought to do about it. Uh, <laughs> unless people think this is chill and we should just let them have the run of our entire cultural life, doesn't seem to be a lot of support for that. How are we going to fight this stuff, Alex? Where do we, where do we begin? There's a lot to say, but I do just want to make a particular point that um, it, is, it is up to us, but it's not up to us as individuals. It's up to us collectively. So it's, it's, a, it's a democratic and collective process. So Righto. we can sh share some ideas, but it's actually really going to be some people getting together with Butcher's Paper and setting up organisations and getting organised. But it, it does have to come... It, it, for those in the in the audience live or who are catching up on this later, there, there's a big responsibility here that hasn't been taken by arts managers and festival directors, yeah. um, but there's a lot of work that's already been led by artists. But I just want to make one more point before we get to solutions, and it's connected to solutions, and in saying that it's going to be us, it's not going to be the billionaires. It's not going to be... even. It's not even going to be hipster billionaires in baseball yeah. caps. Like, it's not going to be renewables it's not going to be another kind of you know yeah it's going to be up to us and it's it's 
it's structural and it's not just about the arts and it's a much I, I do just want to connect it to the bigger history of this nation inverted commas and what's happened on this continent and where this wealth that has been moved around comes, comes from. from it's accrued through the theft of land and it's accrued through stolen labor and through stroke of fortune for certain families that have then been able to set up philanthropic funds or set up big companies and then money makes more money for them to then be dictating which cities get cancer hospitals, what kind of scientific research we do, what arts festivals happen is deeply problematic. So a big piece of this is naming it. So identifying the network map, looking for the connections, seeing where the power lies and, and understanding the problems of it. So I think yep. we've done that bit and we've talked about the problems. And that's also a parallel in the state capture report isn't it in terms of yeah mostly in the state capture report it's not super prescriptive it is much more of a problem statement but it does point to solutions and ideas that are already out there well distributed and well thought through but I'm going to I'll sketch the four recommendations that that we made um, because I think then you spotted some resonances with what the arts community's already doing and needs to maybe do more of <clears throat> the four things that we proposed in this report, which is online, you can find this at the Australian Democracy Network's website if you want to learn more about state capture. Four things that we suggested, one was name it, like be very clear in naming it, call it state capture. We're not dealing with corruption, we're dealing with something a lot more dangerous. But also, we're not dealing with a dead democracy. We're not, m most of us aren't at personal risk by which you want to look at how this works in an oligarchy, look at peace demonstrators in Moscow and St. Petersburg at the moment. We, we aren't going to be followed, most likely, out of this session, okay? We have agency, we can vote, we can do all sorts of stuff, but it starts with naming it, call it what it is. The second thing is uh, the, some of the authors who are involved in this report are uh, working with Australian Conservation Foundation, Human Rights Law Centre, people who are much smarter than me, like real policy boffins, have come up with a thing called the Framework for a Fair Democracy, which is just like the dream team menu of if you wanted to legislate against political donations, real-time disclosure, publishing ministerial uh, diaries, who are these people meeting, truth in advertising, cutting off the kind of funding that people like Clive Palmer can just dump into our electoral systems and just put these bullshit huge billboards everywhere, like all of that stuff can be regulated away if we elect people who are willing to actually stand up to these interest groups and do it. So it's not like we need to abandon politics. In fact, I think we need to go harder. So that's the second thing. The third thing is, and this is maybe gonna have some resonance for this conversation, is raise the costs and create consequences for the things and the entities and the people doing the capturing. Because they love it when we go and pick at Scott Morrison's office they're less happy when we show up in their corporate foyers at Santos, as Extinction Rebellion have done here a couple of times, and take the fight up to them directly. They like being backstage. They don't really like being dragged into the sun. So raising the costs um, is, is one example, and there are a thousand different ways of doing that. And the fourth one is to protect each other against counterattacks, because one of the most dangerous things that you can do in state capture is decide what legislation courts are interpreting. You can decide on the tasking of intelligence agencies. That's what happened in East Timor. That's why Bernard Caleri and Witness K are still in the courts. That's national security agencies doing commercial espionage for the gas industry instead of doing national security. So we need to be able to protect each other because this is potentially going to get bumpier than it is at the moment. So we made four recommendations. They're not prescriptive. They're pretty open with that kind of umbrella perspective of what we're dealing with in the arts, this form of purchasing social license, is embedded in a bigger crisis and in a bigger emergency. I think I again have drifted from my brief, <laughs> but uh, you, you, <laughs> you, said, you said earlier, Alex, that you saw some resonances there for the arts community, so let's go there. Yeah, so again, I'm going to make some suggestions, but I think we have to start thinking in a we far more. So when, I, when we make these suggestions, they're not, oh, this is what I can do as an individual artist on my own with my practice. It needs to be, okay, that's an idea we need to take up through our peak bodies, 
there's been a really incredible, I um, was talking with a great writer friend of mine and advocate Jen Mills about a nine year campaign to get the MEAA to develop a freelance charter. And so working through that kind of collective process through a union is a really interesting way to think about artists working together. The boycott of the Sydney um, Biennale around the trans fields um, yeah. involvement, the recent incredible organising around the Israeli embassy money in the Sydney Festival. Quite often, um, independent artists, it seems counterintuitive to ever refuse an opportunity, but to think about artist strikes, artist withdrawal, I mean, you know, I don't know what the figures are this year, but every year after these big events in Adelaide, the, the government says, and the festival generated X billion dollars for the economy and everyone's really stoked because of all the artists that bring people, audiences yeah. and all the money that gets spent in the economy. So if they're relying on our labour to to achieve that huge economic turnaround, but then they're branding all over it, there's a, there's a decision to withdraw there. But it's very hard if you're a single artist withdrawing. It's very different if we work together en masse. There's a really brilliant um, theatre organisation in the, in, on Turtle Island in the US um, run by Tara Moses, who's a First Nations artist. They're called Groundwater Arts. And they've developed a new clause for contracts that artists can insert. So you get sent your contract and about your engagement and you insert a clause that says that you won't take any fossil fuel money. Again, that does put the onus back on the individual artists, but if all artists are doing that, it, it really, st and every contract comes back to a festival with that clause in it. Um, there's really incredible organising, the Fossil Fuel Free Arts Network in Western Australia, the campaign to get Santos out of Darwin. You know, it sort of, there's been an enormous amount of work and, you know, it was, there's been sessions on it today as well, like masses and masses of conversations about how to green our festivals, how to have bamboo plates and think about flying and our carbon footprint. And I'm not saying this isn't valuable work, but we have to have similar conversations and about a code of ethics for who's funding our work and yep. look at this, like zoom out to the structural. So I think really continuing to name it and understand it to create codes, so similarly to thinking about state capture, that regulation piece, creating codes of conduct or ethical sponsorship frameworks, creating consequences, boycotting or stepping out of festivals. Um, and the last one around participation yeah. is, is activating. And, you know, events like this are really useful for bringing ideas out so that, you know, we've got a, a big conversation, we're talking about art wash, we're introducing concepts of state capture, but to build on this, the local organisations here have to be getting together through their industry bodies, through their network organisations and thinking about how to build power around these conversations collectively. Brilliant. I'm picking up a strong vibe of let's do this together and not feel alone in it whether we're an individual artist or if we're finding ourselves on the board of some of these organisations. There's one here I skipped over and I want to come back to it because I understand uh, there may be some folk watching uh, this, this uh, recording from the UK. Mel Evans and Liberate Tate. We've had wins. Like, it is actually possible to eject these things from our arts organisations. Do you yeah. want to talk about that one? Yeah, it's amazing. And there's just been another one um, this week with another BP getting kicked out somewhere else. National Portrait Gallery. Yeah. Bang, so, BP, they've been a sponsor for years. Yeah, so 30 years. Yeah. So the Liberate Tate campaign went for about six years and it was, it was, it was, um, one of the things that was so incredible about it was that it was a performative intervention. So they did incredible performance protests within the Tate Gallery around BP sponsorship. One of the most extraordinary ones was that they bought a, um, a blade from a, a large windmill. <laughs> What's it called? Turbine. Turbine. Um, and they brought it in in three pieces oh. and constructed it in the in the Tate Gallery. <laughs> and it was an extraordinary action. They did a lot of work with um, molasses and oil, and they did readings and performances. They did a beautiful one where they were during after the Deepwater Horizon during the court case of that they were reading out the transcripts within the gallery in shrouds and and it and it was deeply problematic for tate they didn't know how to take it um yeah. and they won 
they broke the ties with BP. Right. And so that is an undoing of the social licence. And it's spread across Europe and in, across Australia as well. There's been campaigns in, um, during the COP21 in Paris against Shell's um, sp sponsorship of the Louvre in Paris and other galleries in, across London. Yeah. So there's a, there's a, yeah, so Mel Evans wrote this incredible book, um, Art Wash, Big Oil and the Arts. So there's a body of work, there's a body of thinking, there's a trajectory of wins. Yeah. Um, so we've just got to keep going. But we, we have become very used to it here. And then the question I suppose we didn't answer yet, which I don't think that we can answer on our own, but is, okay, so if BHP pull out of Tarnathi, where do we get another 17 million from? Yeah. And how do we transition? And in a way, these are the same questions for towns and cities and communities that have been reliant on fossil fuels as well, for FIFO workers, for communities that are coal communities. You yeah. can't just go, okay, it's over, we're out. There has to be a plan and there has to, and we have to approach the arts in the same way. We want to get them out, but we want to retain the resources. In fact, I think we actually need far more resources. Right. Um, so, you know, we need to look at things like nuclear submarines and military spending and where else our money is going. You want sponsorship by <laughs> nuclear submarines? <laughs> what if some of these companies started paying some tax and then we wouldn't have to be forcing arts organisations into the arms of these monstrous corporations? And it's just a thought. It's just a thought. Yeah, exactly. Why, why has Twiggy Forest not paid tax and instead been able to set up a multi-billion, you know, million dollar foundation and swan around deciding what happens with plastics in the oceans and how he defines modern slavery? All right, we're into it now. One of the reasons I love the Tate story so much is it felt like this instance of kind of campaign jujitsu, where you've turned a strength of the industry, i.e. it splattered its logo all over the Tate, you've turned it into a liability. Suddenly artists and people going to the gallery are being forced to think about what the oil and gas industry actually does. Similarly to the Sydney Festival, and this, it's, it is really unfortunate for artists who aren't there to pick a fight and actually got thrown under a bus. The whole country was abruptly having a conversation about Israeli apartheid and what is actually going on in the occupied territories. And again, it feels like jujitsu. You've turned something into a campaign opportunity. So maybe there's, something, there's plenty of examples of those from closer to home as well. So do we want to talk a little bit about what we're going to do about it? Do people feel like we should do something about it? <laughs> really? Or what? No, I feel like we're going to do something about it. I mean. This isn't going to stay, we're, we're in a moment of great disruption and upheaval as it is. Yeah. Like, change is happening and, you know, I was talking about this with a friend earlier. A lot of the time that I've been involved in activism and campaigning, you feel like you're not getting much of a platform. The conversation is not being heard much beyond the group that... Are, directly impacted or those that are concerned about it and you don't feel like there's necessarily a lot of points of intervention where things might change at the moment it feels like we are in such a messy time the pandemic has created that the fact that we are now living in a climate emergency has created that and it's going to be a long emergency so I don't think it's going to settle anytime soon so yeah. that is frightening because the slippages are dangerous and things are going to some things are going to get a lot harder and be very difficult but it also means that in terms of thinking about other times when I've been trying to intervene and create change it hasn't felt like there was a space to get traction yeah. at the moment it feels like definitions are up for grabs people are going hang on what's happening lots of people are engaged there's a lot of fear and emotion and engagement and so it actually is a moment where we can accelerate change if we engage. So it might feel too hard. It's too hard for any of us on our own, but together it is actually a really critical moment to engage. I love that. I love it. So do you want to throw any more ideas out I'd on like the table? I'd like to get some... We're going to throw to questions. So just let the festival organisers know that we are going to throw to questions the way we're going to do it, because I think we have about another 25 minutes or so together. This gentleman's already onto it. There's a standing mic down here. Uh, if you're able to come to the mic, try and keep it real quick. 
if you've got a manifesto, at least make it sound a bit like a question. Um, but we are, I'm being a little tongue in cheek, but actually this is, this is where we're going to get to work. If you've got ideas, suggestions, stuff you've seen work, let us know. If you've got questions for Alex, let us know. And uh, oh no, but we were going to do something more fun first. If just hold off, yeah, do it. No, I love <laughs> yeah, this idea. Yeah, well, we just thought before we started to hear from people, we'd just like you to turn to someone next to you, let out a breath, quick responses, what stood out for you, ideas and things that you have, and we'd really love to mix up the people that are coming up to the mic as well. So, just take a minute. We'll we'll interrupt you. Turn to someone next to you, preferably someone you don't know, but it's okay if you do. Top of mind, what stuck out for you the most? Couple of minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Happy? Yeah, it's good. We covered so all the things. <laughs> Lots of colour. Um, but yeah, thanks for grabbing me just then. No worries. A good idea. Oh, we're still, these are still on. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's, a few really, there's a few really good people here that will hopefully carry this forward a bit. Have you wound them up to come up to the mic and say stuff? I'm not sure if they will. All right. Let's see. Like, there's a former Sydney Festival person here. And yeah. Well, there's lots of people I don't know, but there's a few, few people that yeah. would be good if they say something. <coughs> there's some XR crew up the back as well, and they've seen a couple of times they'll come to the mic and pitch a particular campaign book. Yeah. Do you reckon we got 200? It's pretty good. It is, hey? Yeah. Yeah, and I think a lot of people will catch up on it afterwards as well. Really good. You do it. <laughs> About another 30 seconds. All right, here we go. Bring your best ideas, your best questions. And um, let's shake things up. Um, perhaps this will shake things up a bit. I, I worked with Santos for 33 years. And I was at the Darwin Festival back in 1994. And I was extremely proud of the way that Santos, even back then, sponsored the Darwin Festival. And it was a fantastic thing. They had small operations in Marini and, and Palm Valley. And you would go out there and they were really trying to do the right thing by the environment, by the indigenous uh, people. Everything had to go through, I'm not sure, the land council or whatever. Uh, it, 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 and, and it was a way that Santos saw as giving back to the community. And at Santos here in, uh, in Adelaide, the, the number of community organisations that would go to Santos uh, to, uh, to get some support for whatever it was, was amazing. And Santos would bend over backwards to try and do it. And there was, you know, the uh, tour down and under. Do you really think they wanted to spend $6 million a year every year to uh, sponsor that event? They'd rather pocket that to do whatever, but they, but they did it. And they did it with the uh, Adelaide uh, Symphony Orchestra, many, many, many things, the Oz Asia Festival. And of course, they're trying to build up some brownie points for when things might not go uh, exactly right, but that's just part of being a corporate, good corporate citizen. Do you want to take it for a second and I'll... What's that? Yeah, answer. No, no, hold, hold off. Yeah. Chill, chill. So, so this things is... have all changed. Things have all changed. Now, Thanks. what they were trying to do was was be a good corporate citizen yeah. and now it's seen as, as being bad. Well, so, hey, wait a minute. Let's let, How can we work together to enable them to pull back or do it somewhere... You know, the funding's got to come from somewhere. If it comes from the government, yep. the same issue is going to apply. I don't want to offend the government. You can see how the ABC gets tangled up in knots. Now, this is, a great, this is a great place okay. to come and offend the government. Um, so you're picking up a bit of flack there, but I actually think it's a valuable perspective just to hear it straight out, right? Because there's folk working in these organisations who are of good heart. And, you know, I've seen this in, the mining, in mining towns in the northwest. It's the footy oval. It's the local theatre, it's like right from the ground up. So I think I think it's handy to actually have that perspective. So thank you for speaking up. However, uh, 
I also want to take your point, maybe that point of departure is that maybe things are changing. And this is not so much about corporate responsibility and putting your logo on stuff or being good corporate citizen or any of this kind of stuff. The planet's on fire. Southeast Queensland is underwater. They've had to evacuate hundreds of thousands of people in the last fortnight because we are burning fossil oil, coal and gas. And that's not an opinion from the stage. That is settled scientific reality since the 1990s. And so this isn't an attack on good people working in these industries. It's a cry for help collectively from, from everybody here where we do have the ability to call this stuff out and in places where these kind, kind of conversations are too dangerous to even occur, to say these industries need to be phased out, closed down, finished, it's over. Uh, it may, there may have been a time in the 1990s where we could have done this gracefully and generally, but they delayed that transition, and that's why we are in the crisis that we're in now. So I feel as though, let's just disentangle, this is not an attack on individuals working in these companies, but structurally, time is up. Time's up. Yeah, I mean, I, I would just say that we need that money. We need that money back and we're going to need it back even more now to pay for the cleanup and it needs to be these companies that are paying for it. But if Santos or BHP or Rio put money into the cleanup in Lismore, they don't get to badge the Lismore Stadium as the Rio Lismore Stadium when they clean it up. It, the, the, the question of the... Like, I, what I really loved about what you said is how proud you felt. And that goes to the heart of why people want to be associated with the arts and culture and sports clubs and community. Because it feels fantastic to support events where people gather and see each other and commune and dance and are together. That's a great thing. I think naming that is really important. But the exchange shouldn't be that the company then gets to badge that joy so that's great go ahead um hi i have um this is in regards to tarnandi and bhp sponsorship and um yeah i've always felt a moral difficulty in you know supporting bhp funded things and then more recently being directly involved um with the festival and with um the art groups that are represented there um, and I'm usually a pretty vocal person, but I haven't spoken up about this because I feel like it's... I don't know if it's my place because I'm not going to be directly impacted or disadvantaged if BHP pull out of that. And so as um, you know, a white, privileged person who can stand and point and say that's wrong that they're funding that, um, you know, it does affect families and, and people the people behind the art and I think it's wrong that it's funded by a fossil fuel company that is directly um, impacting the country that they're painting you know it's it's totally wrong um, but yeah as as a non-indigenous person I'm not sure where my place is in protesting that and how to do that in a way that respects and benefits everyone involved well just to say um, that Thank you. And the Adelaide Festival did reach out to a whole lot of First Nations speakers to be involved today and a lot of really amazing people just weren't available. And I think that there is definitely a, quite an important distinction to be made there around the sovereignty of First Nations communities to make their own choices about this, I think. Um, and, you know, I've worked quite a lot in the north of Western Australia where in Roeburn and communities have been funded by Woodside up there. And uh, and that was something I was going to say earlier as well. Like, I'm, impli I'm complicit in this as well. I've worked on projects funded by fossil fuels. I'm not here as a p taking a pure position. But again, I think, and particularly in the First Nations instance, these companies owe a great debt. They've extracted wealth from First Nations people's country. How First Nations people negotiate that relationship is up to them, but certainly I don't think that companies should also get to put their name on it. They need to give that money back, no doubt. 17 million's not enough. Festivals should get more, but they shouldn't also get to have fancy drinks and swan around, is my opinion. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much to both of you. That was fabulous. Um, uh, it, it sounds as though the yachts is a kind of microcosmos for the rest of everything and um, it's not just about the artists because the corporates 
have come already for everyone else, as you mentioned. And that's why, in a way, we don't have the kind of schools and hospitals and jails and whatever that humans deserve. Because people who could pay a lot of tax don't. And I wonder, is there any model that you know of where corporates, or even the mafia, if they want to, and there's not a lot of difference sometimes, can pay into a large national fund that funds the arts, schools and so on, and it's the fund that is the sponsor. Mm. And the corporate's logo doesn't appear anywhere mm. on those events. I feel like that's called paying tax. <laughs> yeah. The, the, the fund is called Consolidated Revenue. And... Um, there's an important distinction to be made because an industry that is in the process of phasing itself out won't be paying tax, so let's be realistic. There's a bigger economic restructuring question to be had. But the fact is, this again is another signature of state capture, is that these industries for a while now have been writing their own tax codes. Three big mining corporations literally wrote the mining tax. They sat down with Martin Ferguson, the minister, wrote their own piece of tax code and smashed it through the parliament. So we do have a bigger, um, we do have bigger structural issues in play. Right, sure. um, Tim, I, as a student, we were always told it was very important to make sure you're actually addressing the question as set, uh, breaking up with fossil fuels. We seem to have gone a bit off topic. Mining in general is going to be fairly crucial to renewable energy systems. So I, I feel that any discussion of mining in general has slightly lost the plot. Um, you know, the obvious one is going to be lithium. We need all the lithium we can uh, get at the moment. Um, and recognising that a lot of companies, uh, you mentioned BP as one, are actually uh, in a lot of ways leading the change. Um, I couldn't find you know, good figures in a hurry, but BP are still getting the majority of their revenue from oil, but are spending more in renewable energy systems. So isn't there merit in supporting the companies who are ad advancing the progress into renewable energy systems, even though they may have come from a fossil fuel heritage? Let me try. There you go. A couple of things there. <laughs> so uh, I would say there's two quite distinct questions there. So one is about the role of mining and resource extraction to build the new platform, uh, lithium being one example. Um, it feels complex. We probably could do a whole hour on that because that's a fascinating area. I don't think if you're uh, in the resources sector or if you're putting up renewable energy projects for that matter, that you should get any kind of free pass in terms of Aboriginal land rights, environmental impact assessment, health and safety, uh, any of that. So these projects, whether they be for lithium or for coal, should actually be properly assessed and shouldn't get any kind of free pass just because they're notionally green. It's true that, you know, wind turbine is hundreds of tons of steel, there's all sorts of rare earths and exotic stuff in batteries, and I think the, the most profound change that's upon us isn't just substituting coal and gas for solar and wind. It is looking at our entire industrial ecosystem and saying whatever it is, whatever powers it, we can't just continue with this growth paradigm that says in 25 years the economy has to be twice as heavy and twice as intense. Now there are answers for that in the field of circular economics, for example, or in, or in regenerative economics that says our economic processes, the materials that we vacuum in, process and dump on the edge of town, need to be folded into a much more circular economic flow. And yes, that involves resource extraction. But if the traditional owners say no, or in Bolivia, the, the, you know, the people say no, you don't get to have a coup. You don't get to amend the Native Title Act to force people off country, whether it's a greeny mineral or not. What was the, now the second piece was more about, oh, I might, have a, I might have a disagreement with you, I suspect not a strong one, on whether any of the oil majors are seriously invested in transitioning. BP is not. You know, they, they have a lot of solar panels on their web page. They're investing a fraction, I believe it's less than 2%. None of the four oil majors are investing more than about 2% in clean energy. They are heavily investing in new oil and gas. And for, for that, again, all I can say is, guys, time's up. Time is up. 
if you've got real different figures, I'll, I'll grab you after. But it's, it's absolutely he's, at the margin. He's margins. got his iPad out, Scott. I don't have an <laughs> iPad. I'm at a disadvantage. Alex, do you want to jump in? No, no. Let's go, Emma. All right, let's go. Back to the arts. <laughs> Thank you both. I think this is like an incredibly important discussion um, here today. I want to kind of put a provocation, I guess, um, to, to you and to other people here that I think that one of the things that we could actually take as an action is that we do want to focus on, on the arms industry and the so-called defence industry in South Australia. The arms industry in South Australia, um, which is you know called the defence industry, is, is a massive part of the economy it's you know South Australia is a huge part of the the national arms um, sector and you know in it's very much what both Labor and Liberal are running on in the election at the moment around you know you know it gets called all these different things a focus on space which is still the military industrial complex the stuff that's happening at lot 14 this obviously the submarines um, the thing that the point that I want to make I guess is though is that I think the reason why we're starting to see arms manufacturers on arts boards is because the defense industry gets wrapped up in notions of creative industries and of innovation and skills development and um, skilled innovative jobs essentially um, so there's a really strong ideological connection between creative industries and innovation in defence industries and we can see it. We can see it in the way that they've, they've been speaking about things like Lot 14. So I would encourage everyone to kind of really resist that in the South Australian arts sector, um, to really do, to look at our boards um, and to think that, you know, in South Australia we can actually play a role around the defence, you know, the narrative around the defence industry and its role in warmongering at this incredibly warmongering time and I'm sorry it's a comment basically no, <laughs> no but it. it's really useful and I'll, I'll and I'll throw it to you to hey. maybe but I just wanted to mention that on this front it's it's even trickier because um, Lockheed Martin aren't going to say Lockheed Martin opening night because it would be too much of a target so there's some companies that social license is going to be purchased in a more insidious manner than in the public one and the arms industry is certainly one of those and you know we know through the pandemic and certainly now in Ukraine and Russia that their profits are skyrocketing so I think it's a really and th and they're an industry that doesn't like a lot of attention so I think it's really great you brought that up yeah <laughs> thank you indeed for bringing it up if it was if it was climate and fossil conversation that brought you to this talk I love that we're ending with with some thoughts about the military industrial complex. It is the world's largest carbon emitter. Um, it's one of the reasons why in the confronting state capture report, our second case study was weapons industry because it's unregulated. It's not total up in, you know, the kind of nationally reportable commitments that are going up to the Paris Agreement. They, they got a free pass. They negotiated a free pass. And have you noticed that the world is on the brink of World War III at the behest of a petro state? You know, it's just, this is an oil war, an oil and gas war, that people's lives are being destroyed in Ukraine at the moment. So if we needed another argument, I don't think we did, but just in case, <laughs> to phase out these lethal industries, there's another one. Um, but and yeah, uh, what can we do? What's, how do people find the IPAN campaign? Or IPAN, oh yeah, okay, great. There's a, I mean, South Australia has a, a wonderful peace movement. I suspect what's happening at the moment is gonna refresh it, is gonna bring a bunch of new blood. Again, as Alex started out, don't feel alone. That's the main thing. You're, we're not the only people who feel like this. IPAN is the Independent and Peaceful Australia Network. Uh, I can, if it's the nuclear weapons side that um, keeps you awake at night. Uh, the International Campaign for the Abolition of Nuclear Weapons, started here in Australia, won a Nobel Peace Prize. There's a ton of people working on this stuff. Um, find the others, go find them. Don't feel like you're by yourself. We've got time for one more. We've got time for well, one more, and there appears to be one more. Excellent. Shoot. Uh, okay, I've got a, a bit of a point about the first question, and I think it's really important that people under, uh, understand, which is the uh, when it comes to Santos, they've been aggressively lobbying the state government for decades about increasing the share um, ownership holding cap available at the company. And back in 2007, 2008-ish, they actually entered into an agreement with the RAND government about increasing that cap. And one of the things that came out about that, in, in that agreement, it's called a deed of undertaking, is that Santos has to invest in community has to have a community fund to invest in different things. 
That's why we have the Santos Twitter under the, uh, or the Santos Festival of Cycling, the Santos Museum of Ec Economic Botany. All of these things aren't coming out the goodness of their heart. They're coming out of the fact that we have aggressive lobbying that now looks like greenwashing, but they get the benefit of the lobbying and the greenwashing, and it's disgusting. It's the state capture. Anyway, the point I was going to quickly make. Sorry, I didn't want to do <laughs> that. At least try and pretend to chuck a question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sorry. I, I, I'm trying to avoid swearing as well. Um, <laughs> I've been trying real hard too. I think probably all of us have. Yeah, I, I think the other thing, just to uh, build on the point that was made before, that it's of how sometimes it's hard for individuals to take action, especially you know at, at, an, uh, art, at, a, at an arts event and so on. There's also like the network side really matters on the other end. So it's possible to reach out to existing like social movements. I hate to give a bit of a plug, but locally, Do like it. you know, uh, there's a really active group of ex called Extinction Rebellion. And there's ways to reach out to them to, uh, in a secure way that will protect your identity. And if you let us know about some event or some, you know, oil executive or MP coming out, let us know and we will disrupt the shit out of it <laughs> because that's what we do. <laughs> Thanks so much. All right, we got there. And um, that was beautiful. I look. I play football and I've played ho hockey all my life, so I never. I don't want to start a sport versus art thing. But Tennis Australia just got rid of Santos, so um, yes, they did. come on, artists! Like <laughs> it can be done. I feel like so we are at time. We're gonna we're gonna wrap up. Um, but one thing that has kind of been bubbling away in the back of my mind the whole time we've been talking is is that these industries are messing with artists. Artists are creative people, right? We can come up with ways of confronting these industries that either maybe haven't been tried before or stuff that we tried before where maybe the moment wasn't quite ripe, maybe it would work now, but let's be creative and really turn this enormous incumbency and power that these folk have back on themselves. Uh, seeing, it was probably two years ago, or maybe three years ago now, artists taking to the stage at Fringe World in Perth sponsored by Woodside, and calling it out, turning that into performance. So the audiences are like, what the hell is happening? Is this, folks, this is art. Art can be confrontational, and it can be uncompromising. So let's get to work. Now, were you here for a very quick, sneaky question, or just to say good day? Because we, we're just about at time. I don't know if this is on or not. I believe it is. Uh, <laughs> in the early 90s, over the road there, we had um, Midsummer against nuclear war. We had painters, writers, artists. We had a great big circle. We had meetings every month. We went out into our communities. Peace, peace, peace. Bless. Okay. I launched the Alfreda Peace Foundation several years ago in the press. Um, I am a Buddhist. Peace, peace, peace. Nothing else makes sense. How primitive can you get having a Minister of Defence, for Christ's sake, have a Minister of Peace? Bless. What's the matter with people? <laughs> That's how we're going to wrap, folks. Let's go out and make some mayhem. Thanks for coming. Peace, peace, peace. Peace, peace, peace. <laughs>